Hi everyone, I suggest we slowly start. So today we have um, a guest, Charlotte Lotzes, who is a PhD student at the TU Dresden, the Chair for Network Dynamics, and the Chair for Network Dynamics and the Center for Advancing Electronics Dresden. Charlotte um, got her bachelor's from the TU Freiburg and her master's from the TU Dresden. And she's going to talk about mathematical models for right pooling, which are an important aspect of sustainable mobility now. Thank you for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you. Liz. Okay, um, before I will come to my own research project and present you some insights from my PhD, um, I want to tell you a few things that our um, chair also does because it might be interesting for you for further corporations. Maybe I thought um, I wanted to give you a short overview. So the chair for network dynamics uh, works with network systems, as you might maybe. Oh, no, <laughs> or think. Um, and there are networks around us everywhere. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I didn't expect to have so few faces right in front of me, but maybe you can just make up some networks that you know and just unmute yourself and say them like, what are popular networks around us? Or write in the chat if you don't have a microphone with, suitable microphone with you. Also fine. Do you have any ideas? Like, where do you expect to meet networks in your life, everyday life? I mean, all kinds of um, computer networks, I think is something I've worked with quite a lot. The internet is the most famous network uh, these days, yeah. Oh. Further ideas? Otherwise, I'll just tell you. <laughs> okay, if you don't have any ideas, um, oh, um, job network, yeah, social networks in general, where people interact. Mail delivery, okay. Transport networks, very nice, very nice. Yeah, I have a picture for that. So this was one I thought of as well. <laughs> yeah. Also, signal networks, nice, yeah. Okay, so you see in cells, yeah, in neural networks, for example, communication in our body works uh, in network systems as well. So as you can see, networks are all around us and very important in our everyday lives. Another important uh, example are um, power grids, for example. Or here you can see um, the COVID-19 um, spread in Germany also modeled as a network. So uh, infection models are often done in ne network uh, structures as well. So networks are very important and everywhere around us. And at our chair, we aim to understand fundamental effects that happen in networks to then use this understanding to predict and control these systems. So we focus more on the real um, fundamental research and on the understanding part um, and less on the optimization in the end, but uh, our knowledge builds the basis for that. So this is basically what we aim for. And um, we have three main topics that we focus on at the moment. The first one are energy systems, so mainly power grids um, and the sustainability of them. Um, for example, uh, another PhD student um, made a model to uh, predict the sustainability of um, photovoltaic cells, uh, where he showed that it is not only important to build photovoltaic cells because you say at some point they will, they will save CO2 emissions, but um, in the beginning when you build them, you will have some uh, carbon emissions for the construction of the elements. And if you construct them in a non-clever way, then uh, it might happen that you will never reach the amortization of the energy if you just go on uh, and construct more and more photovoltaic cells. Um, if you are more interested in any of the things that I'll say right now, then I just, uh, yeah, then I will not go more into detail because this is not my research. I don't know too much about that. Um, then please just contact my colleagues. You can find more information on the website that was uh, on the first slide given on the first slide. Yeah, another important um, network system is the uh, brain. So neural networks and the communication of cells um, is also a research topic that we focus on, um, also a bit um, in the direction of um, computing, so natural computation um, with, for example, machine learning, uh, where you also use the structure of neural networks um, is also a topic that we focus on. Again, there we try to understand how it actually works uh, on a very basic level and try to really go deep into it um, and do some also um, 
inverse network uh, research, but this is really not what I know too much about. And the third uh, topic, what I'm going to talk about today is the collective dynamics of sustainable mobility. Um, and we try to think more of a systemic change there. So uh, we do not uh, think about um, making the vehicles that we already have automated or making them electric too much, but we more focus on um, shared mobility where you have different uh, a different system underlying. Um, that's also why it's very important to do that theoretically um, first, because experiments are hard to do. But I will come to this in more detail right now, so I will not talk too much about this uh, focus group of our, um, of our chair, but uh, give you the insights that I have uh, from my PhD and hope that you then have an overview of what our group does in this subgroup as well. So this was just as a quick introduction. Um, and now I want to talk about data science and sustainable mobility and also a physics perspective. So I am a theoretical physicist. I do data science um, as one of my tools, but my basic aim is to understand um, the basic phenomena and fundamental phenomena. And why is sustainable mobility important? Uh, you should all know that carbon emissions go through the roof at the moment, and transport emits approximately one-fifth of these carbon emissions. So this is already a lot. But more important, the carbon emissions in transport sector have not changed in the last 30 years. So although we already try to reduce carbon emissions, they stay constant in the transport sector. This makes transport a very important sector to reduce carbon emissions in future. And I will focus on um, passenger transport in particular because this is very in inefficient at the moment. So we have a low vehicle occupancy. On average, only 1.3 users are situated in uh, one car in individual mobility. And also we have a rare utilization of the vehicles. So usually we just have um, the car are just the cars are used 45 minutes a day. Um, that means that they are parked and standing around without any benefits for our society more than 23 hours a day. And we could use this um, potential, this mobility potential of our cars much better. And to prevent climate change and have our planet, we have to reduce carbon emissions in the transport sector. So this inefficient individual mobility usually means that you have origins and destinations of different users, but they will all just go by their own car on a direct route. And uh, all these routes now sum up to a long total route length. And it would be more efficient if one bus would serve multiple users. So if this bus would just pick up um, the users one after each other and then have on in total a shorter route length. Um, and for the stops uh, on the lower part um, of this figure, um, the direction is different, so it wouldn't make sense to take the same bus, but it would be more feasible to have a second bus than delivering them, but also in a combined and shared manner, so that you don't have too much route length per user. So this is the basic idea um, to reduce the route length by sharing the trips. This is what I call ride pooling in the future. And an important question is, of course, uh, when or whether ride pooling is actually sustainable. Um, in 2018, there has been quite a lot of debate on that in the USA. I don't know whether you've heard about that already, um, because studies have shown that ride sharing services actually increase congestion in cities. So actually, the idea was to have less cars, but um, ride sharing increased the congestion. Um, but that was basically not because uh, People like the, the ride sharing did not replace private cars, but there in these cities it replaced uh, pedestrians or cyclists. So you had more traffic in the end. That is more a social thing behind ride sharing. So we have to ask ourselves not whether ride pooling is sustain sustainable, but when is it actually sustainable? And before I try to answer this question, I want to tell you why methods from physics are actually helpful there. Um, so transport systems are complex and they are interconnected. They contain many agents, so really many agents. This is like a many body um, problem actually. And um, they show collective phenomena. I will explain one collective phenomena later on so that you can maybe better understand what I mean by that. And also they are hard to test. So um, you cannot simply uh, double the size of the vehicles or install uh, three times as many vehicles as you have there or just 
ask twice as many users to participate in the system just to have different parameter settings, is, it is really hard to test. Um, and that's, that's why it makes a lot of sense to have abstract theoretical models before to then define windows for experiments um, that you ca can have later on. And physical methods generally aim for a fundamental and systemic understanding that is then transferable, and they simplify complex pro problems. Um, so they make abstract models and get rid of all the influence that is maybe not that important for some ethics that we try to find. And then we try to distinguish ethics from background noise. And that's why physical methods can be very helpful for transport systems. And I will now show you an example where physics can explain a uh, phenomenon from transport. Here you see um, some streets in the city of Seoul. And um, on the left, there is one street on the right, there is one street and in the middle is this connecting highway. And to make this structure a bit more clear, I just put some lines in the figures. So we try to have, or yeah, the structure that we can see here is um, a street on the left and a street on the right. They are a bit hard to see due to the highway. And in the middle, a highway that connects both streets. And um, they had bad traffic in 2003. Um, this picture was taken, they had bad traffic and the city decided to deconstruct the highway. They deconstructed the highway and now they have only the two streets on the left and on the right left and the traffic is better. This is counterintuitive. So usually you would expect that a highway makes traffic better because there are more, car, more cars fit on the highway and you will have less congestion. Um, and uh, physical phenomenon can explain why this is maybe counterintuitive but why it makes sense that the traffic improved by deconstructing the highway. So if you have two cities um, that are connected by a simple street network, um, we can assume that some, some of the streets um, have always same velocity. Those are inner city streets and they have a constant velocity or constant travel time on the edges, let's say it's travel time six. And between the cities, um, you have uh, streets that are traffic dependent. So if there is a lot of traffic, then the streets will get congested and it takes longer to travel along this road. And if there is few traffic, then you are faster on these roads. Um, so uh, the travel time along these streets depends on the number of users that use the street. We will call this N now. Okay, so let's um, also construct a highway in the middle to make the traffic faster. This is a super highway, so um, there are infinitely many cars on this highway and the traffic does not depend on the number of cars on this highway as well. Now we want to see how long people take to travel from the green to the red dot. And we assume that the people act selfishly, so each driver will themselves always decide to take the route that is fastest for them. If we don't have any other cars around, so n equals zero, um, then the travel time on these time-dependent edges would be one, and the fastest route would be to go the zigzag route. Yeah, then you have travel time three, this is the fastest route rate. So this is what users would selfish selfishly choose. Okay, now let's imagine what happens if we don't have the highway. If we don't have the highway, the system and the rest of the system stays similar, um, but then you cannot take the like this fast zigzag route and the traffic would split. So you can either take the route, the upper route, which would have travel time seven, or you can take the lower route, which would also have travel time seven, but the traffic will split so that on each of those streets, half of the users N will travel. Now we have n equals zero, so the travel time is um, similar in the left and in the right plot. But what happens now if we increase the number of users? If we now have um, n equals one, then in the left-hand side, it is still the fastest way to choose the zigzag route and you have a travel time of five. On the right-hand side, half of the users will go the upper path and half will go the lower path. So on these travel time, uh, the travel time on these traffic dependent edges will be 1.5. And then you will have a travel time of 7.5 in the end. Okay, let's increase the number of users even further. Um, if we have n equals two, then the travel time on the left-hand side is seven, on the right-hand side it's eight. So you're faster with the highway, that is what we expect. But if we increase the travel time even further now, then something interesting happens. On the left-hand side, the zigzag route is still the fastest, but both um, of the streets that depend on the number of users where the travel time depends on the number of users are very crowded because all cars go this way. 
So you have a total travel time of nine here. But on the right hand side, the, the traffic splits and half of the users go the upper path, half go the lower path, so that the travel time dependent streets are not that congested and you have a faster travel time in the end. So here you can see that with this simple model, only with five edges or even four edges on the right hand side, you can explain why a highway does not have to be better. So if the users act selfishly and always choose the route where they are fastest, um, and you have travel time. Uh, you have travel times that depend on the number of users on the streets. Then this simple model can explain why the average travel time is smaller without the highway. Without the highway, if you have a certain demand on the edges. So this is an example where physical methods can help to understand what happened in the city of Seoul. In the city of Seoul, yeah. Um, on the left hand side, we have the super highway, but because users now like all users use the same route right now due to selfish route choice, we have bad traffic. Uh, and here, if we separate the selfish drivers and force them to stay on their side of the street, then we will have better traffic. Okay, so now you all trust me that physics, physical methods can be helpful. And now I can <laughs> tell you what I actually did. So, um, ah, no. I'm sorry, I was that prepared. Before I tell you what I actually did, I give you a very rough overview of what is actually done in the research on ride pooling. So we are not the only group that focuses on understanding ride pooling. There is a few, uh, there are a few other groups. And for example, um, they asked the question, how efficient is ride, ride pooling actually? So they also use network methods there and build shareability graphs. So they put all the users that have similar directions together and uh, linked them in a network and then um, made their route choices from there. And so they can calculate how efficient or how much cars you can save um, by ride pooling in a certain city. Another question that um, is asked in research is how to, do we actually do this? Like how do we efficiently combine the trips? This is more algorithmical research. So there you try to find the best algorithm to quickly calculate if you have many users, which bus will actually like serve which user. Um, this is more operations research. And you can also look at this from the user perspective. So you can also have more social questions um, and ask what the users actually want and when do the users want to share the trips. Um, there are also um, ansatzes with machine learning there, for example. Um, and I now try to answer the question, when is ride pooling actually sustainable? Um, and therefore we introduce a simple model. So uh, our model is very abstract. We try to get rid of all influences that we might not need. Uh, so we will, for example, have a fixed number of buses um, and a constant demand. So um, there will always be the same amount of users in our system. We also have a constant velocity of the buses and a very simple assignment algorithm. If you're interested in that, I can give you more information on the assignment algorithm in the end, but I will skip that here and first tell you what we actually find. And to evaluate the system, um, we do simulations that are really dynamic. So there, a request appears, they are Poisson distributed, and then um, a bus is assigned to that request to, to serve it, then the bus will pick up the request. And um, while the bus travels to serve the request, other requests appear and so on. And in the end, we, um, we evaluate uh, distributions, average value, standard deviation, and things like that. And I will now introduce quantities that we will have a look on. One interesting quantity is how far do the buses actually drive? We call this the total distance driven. This is the length of the blue routes. So the sum of those routes, uh, of those, the length of those routes. Um, and this is somehow proportional to the energy consumption and to the carbon emissions. Of course, it is not perfectly um, proportional, but we will just assume that this is the only factor that gives us a sustainability. So if we have a high total distance driven, this is not so sustainable. And if we have a short total distance driven, this is much more sustainable. And we will compare it to the direct requested distance. The direct requested distance is the distance that the users would travel if they go directly by their private car. So here marked in yellow. And we also sum this. So here we have to sum over more, over more lines in the end. Um, and to compare it, we will simply divide the total distance driven by the direct requested distance and measure the ratio. Um, 
And if the ratio is larger than one, that means that the ride-sharing buses actually travel further than the users would have gone by individual mobility. This can happen if you have pickup detours. So if the bus is not um, at the same point where the request appears, then it, the bus first has to drive to the origin and then they can deliver the users. So um, that the relative route length is larger than one and the driven route length is larger than the requested distance can happen when we have pickup detours. So we call this taxi regime. And on the other hand side, when the relative route length is smaller than one, we call this ride pooling regime because then the buses save route length compared to the private cars. And that, of course, they still have this pickup detour because they still have to come to the users to pick them up. But um, the overlap of the routes saves so much route length that in the end, the buses will drive shorter than the cars would have driven. Okay. And I made this nice sketches here because from the names, you already get a guess that tax regime means, okay, there are not so many users in the vehicle. It's more serving everyone one by one. And ride pooling regime means, okay, we have like really, we really pool the rides. We have crowded vehicles. So we could maybe naively assume that the average occupancy gives us the relative route length. Okay. So we did simulations and we plot the relative route length versus the average occupancy here. Um, and the relative route length smaller than one is marked green here and relative route length larger than one taxi regime is marked red here. And we can see that the average occupancy does not predict the relative route length. So we can have average occupancies larger than two, and still for some number of buses, the service would not be in the sustainable regime yet. So it would still be less sustainable than individual mobility. This is somehow counterintuitive. Um, and there are two reasons why we want to get rid of this occupancy now. First, the occupancy is observable itself. So we would always have to first simulate the system to get the occupancy, and then we can also still like right away measure the relative route length. So it's not that helpful to have another observable here. And it does not predict the transition from the taxi to the ride pooling regime. So when we know the, the occupancy, we have no idea whether the service is really sustainable now. And this can be a problem because policymakers use the occupancy as a measure to force um, ride pooling services to be sustainable. So in Germany, there are some laws in discussion at the moment, uh, maybe due to lobbyism, um, they want to use the occupancy um, and tell the services, okay, you have to have at least occupancy larger than one or two or something. But they can still be unsustainable. They can just have a high occupancy and be unsustainable. And for this reason, we introduce another quantity. We want to have a quantity that is an order parameter. So it shouldn't be an observable, but it should be known before simulations or before running a service. And it should please predict the transition from the taxi to the ride pooling regime so that we can use it to tell people to have a sustainable service. And therefore, we use the direct requested distance. We already know this from the last slide. So this is how far all the cars want to go in total, how far the users want to go in total. And um, we use the driven distance potential. So this is a quantity that we can also know beforehand, before we actually run a service, because we only need how many buses will be in the service and how fast will they be on average and how long will they, like how long do we have the service running? So tau is the service time, v is the velocity of the buses, the average velocity and v is the number of buses. And if we now um, divide the requested distance by this driven distance potential, we call this load. And the load, um, the load can predict the transition from the taxi regime to the ride pooling regime. So here, um, I plot the relative route length measured from the same um, simulations as on the, in the left picture. But now I plot them versus the load that I have just introduced. And once the load is larger than one, then all simulations are sustainable. So they are all in the right pooling regime where you save route length. On the left-hand side, when the load is smaller than one, then strange things can happen because it depends a bit on the number of buses and where actually the requests appear, how far the buses will travel then. So this is not completely similar here, but we can at least always say when we will be sustainable. So we can say, okay, if you fix the load in your system, to a value larger than one. So if you ensure that you don't have too many buses or you have enough users, however, where you want to, um, where you want to like, 
modify it. Um, if you ensure that your load is larger than one, we can tell you, okay, your service is sustainable. This software is nice. But the simulations that I've shown you here have been done with a very simple toy model. And um, you could now say that maybe they are not too realistic. So we try to get more realistic and include data into the simulations. And of course, the first problem is always to get data. Data is not always easy available. But uh, Manhattan, the, the part of New York City that is called Manhattan, um, let's, let's have these questions in the end. <laughs> Um, Manhattan um, has public taxi data, so they publish um, the origins and the destinations of users. Um, and in 2016, they were even quite precise. So we use the Manhattan Street Map from OpenStreetMap, um, where we can use the edges, the corners, and the length of the streets as a weight. But we neglect um, some things, for example, the width of the streets, so how fast they get congested, um, or the average speed on the streets. We will neglect that so far. And we use these taxi data um, so that the requests are extracted from the taxi trips um, in the Manhattan data. We use the data from 2016 because this is more precise than what they published right now. Um, and we really want to have the corners where the people start and end their requests. We have approximately 2 million requests in that week that um, I used for the simulations. And we use the time of the request, the coordinates where the requests started and where the requests wanted to go and project them to the closest corner in the network. And then we repeat the simulations, but now not um, on the Euclidean grid, but now on the network. But um, real data always brings some challenges. For example, of course, the computations are more demanding if we have um, so many requests, 2 million requests. And the request rate in Manhattan fluctuates. So, so far we had constant demand, but now we have um, valleys where you have few requests in the night and we have peaks in the morning, peaks in the evening. And also the request rate does not only fluctuate, but also there is some directedness in the requests. So in the morning, people want to go into some certain centers and in the evening, they want to go out again. Um, this makes it also more difficult to because uh, the directedness is not captured by the load so far. Um, and also, the, this is now the driven distance uh, in blue in the curve, um, in the plot here. The driven distance is limited by the driving potential of the buses. So they cannot drive for more than just driving around all the time. Um, and in the peaks, you can see that requests accumulate here, and it takes longer until the buses have less to do in the night again. And the more requests um, accumulate here, the longer is the delay that comes from that. So the request rate drops here, but the number, uh, but the buses are still busy, and much later um, they start to get idle again. And um, this means there is also time delay in our simulations. And it is hard to deal with all these things when we will now evaluate it. But nonetheless, I will show you um, what we got so far. <laughs> so here you see now simulations with the Manhattan data. The, they are evaluated by hour. So um, due to the fluctuating request rate, we do not simply average over the whole simulation anymore. But um, we evaluate how far the buses drive and how far the users wanted to go for each hour. And if we plot this versus the average occupancy, oh, there is, a, there is a mistake in the data here. It shouldn't be smaller than zero. I have to check that at home. Sorry for that. Um, but nonetheless, you can see here that the average occupancy does not tell us whether we are sustainable or not. But the load does. So here on the right-hand side, um, I plot the relative road length versus the load. And we can see now that the data points do not lie perfectly on the one over x curve, even for loads larger than one, but they do always lie be below that curve. So we can maybe not predict how sustainable the service will be for a certain load, but we can tell that the service is definitely sustainable. And that there is this difference um, that comes from all the challenges that I've shown you on the last slide. And we still have to figure out how we deal with these challenges best, um, whether we include directedness into the load or um, whether we can improve our model um, to, to have um, maybe better better outcome here. And also, we have to definitely check this picture where we have occupancies uh, smaller than zero. I'm sorry for that. So um, these results are not published yet, but uh, we have already written a paper draft on that and hope to publish it soon. 
But um, the main finding is that we can introduce with the load an order parameter that tells us whether our service or that tells us when our service will be sustainable so that we can force as policymakers, for example, we can force right pooling services to be sustainable. And um, that means when we ask the question, when is right pooling sustainable, we can now tell you when it is sustainable with the load. Um, and we can thus tell you how to reduce pollution and congestion with the help of right pooling and um, help that in the future right pooling services like Lyft and Uber will not increase congestion in San Francisco, but we can force them to decrease it. And um, I've also shown you how an abstract model plus real-world data can help to develop measures for sustainability. Um, I have done the work together with my professor, Mark Timmer, and my supervisor, Maite Schröder. And so these are some co-workers, also PhD students, Felix Jung and Philip Mar Marshall. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention. I have published my first paper in March. This is not what I brought you today. Um, this is some, something different, but also very interesting. So there I could tell you now um, how walking can make this ride pooling even faster and more attractive, although you might maybe not think that it's like that. If you are also interested in that paper, I also brought slides on that and I can uh, like, still tell you something about that later on. But um, so far, thank you for your attention. I hope that you learned something today, what our group does, what I do, and um, how we can maybe replace private cars by a more sustainable service. Um, and I'm very happy to answer questions right now. I would first open for questions. And if you are really eager to get to know more about this paper, then we can have that afterwards as well. So thank you very much.